Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone. My name is Luis Querol. I am a neurologist uh, uh, in Barcelona in Hospital San Pau. And uh, I am delighted to be here in this uh, Inflammatory Neuropathy Day, uh, sharing with you some of the novel advances in the, in the field. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for inviting me and, and hope that this uh, session uh, is enjoyable for you. Let me share my screen. So as I said, uh, I'm Luis Querol, uh, but also I'm talking on behalf of Elba Pascual, that is the next Benson Fellow for the GBS ADP Foundation, and that has helped me um, uh, with all the, all the updates and the slides. Uh, this is a long talk. I hope not to bore you too much, but I wanted to provide a scientific update uh, that is covering most of the uh, hot topics in the field. Uh, some of it might be a little bit um, maybe even difficult to understand sometimes uh, for, for outsiders of the field. Uh, other things are more straightforward, but I, I, at least I wanted to uh, cover all the, the topics that need to be covered in a, in a proper scientific update in, in, our, in our opinion and also uh, provide some context uh, so you know where we come from and where we are going. These are my disclosures. Some of them are relevant for, for this talk because uh, I am going to talk about treatments and I'm going to talk about uh, clinical trials or novel treatments or future therapies. So uh, here you have my disclosures. First of all, autoimmune neuropathies, as you may probably know, are a heterogeneous group of, of rare peripheral nerve disorders uh, that uh, have uh, poorly understood causes and mechanisms, uh, but basically they all have in common that they respond usually to immune modulatory or immune suppressant therapies. And we divide them into big groups, acute, mainly Guillain-Barre syndrome and its variants, and chronic, that include several disorders. The main ones are CIDP, multifocal motor neuropathy, and uh, uh, polyneuropathy associated with monoclonal gammopathy with anti-MAG antibodies. And in the middle, we have a novel category of disorders of which we are going to also talk that are the autoimmune nodopathies. We are going to talk about causes and mechanisms, diagnosis, monitoring and therapy, not for all the diseases, but uh, some of the things that we are going to cover are uh, transversal, some others are disease specific, but these are the things we are going to talk about. It, starting with Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, which is the most frequent of the disorder and probably the, the best known of all of them, you know that this is an acute monophasic disorder in which uh, patients present with weakness, with sensory problems, uh, with a reflection, and that uh, arises as a post-infectious disorder. Uh, usually an infection triggers an immune response that then uh, becomes a disease uh, of the peripheral nerves. There are many different types of Guillain-Barre, uh, you can see, depending on what uh, part of the body they involve, uh, they can be motor, sensory, they can be uh, upper and lower limbs, only lower limbs, etc. cetera. Uh, and basically, uh, there are two big types, one in which uh, the disorder or the immune response attacks the, the myelin sheath of the nerves, which means the, the isolating cover that every nerve has, or uh, the other subtype is when the axon, uh, meaning the neuron itself, the, the neuron uh, prolongation is the one that is attacked by the, by the immune system. Usually we have an infection, uh, antibodies against this infection appear, uh, and these antibodies uh, cross-react with, um, with the peripheral nerve, and uh, the disease starts and uh, then usually progresses over two weeks. Most of the times it stabilizes in a, in a nadir and then it starts improving slowly in a process that takes weeks, months, or even years. Um, in the most basic form, uh, the one that we know best is uh, that that is triggered by uh, bacteria that is called Campylobacter jejuni and that is co and causes diarrhea. And this diarrhea causing bacteria has some molecules in the membrane that are very similar to some molecules that are present in the nerve. 
This is an schema of the nerve. This is a nerve and this is a small piece of the nerve. And you can see that this bacteria has this molecule that is called gangliocyte, that is essentially the same that the one we have in the nerve. So when you do antibodies, when you produce antibodies against this bacteria, then there is a cross reaction of this antibody against this uh, same molecule in the nerve. And this is what triggers a, a, a inflammation, a complement activation. You will see what that means and in the end damage of the peripheral nerves. These antibodies, the most, the best known ones are anti the gangliocyte GM1. This is the name of the gangliocyte, but there are many others. Uh, we know uh, some of the causes of Guillain-Barré, uh, Campylobacter is one, but a more recent one is, for example, Zika virus. There was a pandemic of Guillain-Barré syndrome that followed a pandemic of Zika virus infections. This was relatively uh, unknown in the rest of the world, in Europe, in Northern uh, North America, but it was really a big problem in the ICUs of um, uh, uh, tropical or subtropical countries, including many Latin American countries, African and Polynesian countries. Another cause that has been uh, very widely um, talked about, uh, but it is not clear, is COVID-19. Uh, there are many reports associating COVID-19 with the development of Guillain-Barré, uh, but the best epidemiological studies do not show uh, uh, um, an increase in the number of GBS cases uh, uh, despite very high frequency of uh, COVID cases in the population. So, so far, it is more or less accepted that COVID-19 is not associated with um, the development of Guillain-Barre syndrome, or at least not uh, uh, in, in the vast majority of patients. And then there is the very important issue of vaccination. Um, the, you probably know that uh, COVID-19 vaccination and any other vaccination have been uh, associated with the potential to develop Guillain-Barre syndrome. This uh, is a very old story that comes from the 70s, but uh, to summarize it, uh, the idea is that even though some uh, vaccines uh, certain types of vaccines may associate to very uh, small numbers of Guillain-Barre cases. In general, vaccination is not a big issue in uh, development and the development of Guillain-Barre syndrome. Um, in this case, in the case of, uh, of COVID-19, there are two vaccines uh, that are the AstraZeneca and the Janssen vaccine, both of them adenoviral uh, vaccines that have reported a very small increase in, in Guillain-Barre syndrome cases of what we would expect in a normal year. Uh, this didn't happen for Pfizer, Moderna, and all the mRNA vaccines, but it did happen uh, in a very uh, in, in, in a frequency of around uh, five cases per million uh, vaccinations, and uh, this is what we have so far. So, uh, as I said, certain vaccines might be associated with a slight increase in, in Guillain-Barre syndrome, but, some, uh, but most of them don't. And even in those ones that are associated with Guillain-Barre syndrome, the benefit of the vaccination is so big, is so clear, so powerful, that uh, it compensates very much the uh, small increase in Guillain-Barre syndrome cases. Um, the other novelty in Guillain-Barre syndrome uh, is that the new diagnostic guidelines, there are new diagnostic guidelines that are going to be published soon. They have been presented uh, already in the Peripheral Nerve Society and the uh, European Academy of Neurology. They are not published yet, but these will, uh, let's say, frame how the diagnosis has to be made in the future uh, when these uh, guidelines are already published. Then we jump into, jump into chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyradicular neuropathy. This is chronic neuropathy. This is the most frequent chronic inflammatory neuropathy. Despite that, it's a very rare disease anyway. In this case, symptoms are very similar to Guillain-Barré, weakness, sensory disturbances, reflexia. But in this case, it's chronic progressive or relapsing, and there is no an infectious trigger. Uh, it's uh, defined by the presence of demyelination, by the presence of this uh, loss of the myelin sheath of the myelin cover that the nerves have. 
Uh, one important thing that has been clear in the last years is that uh, CIDP is not a disease, is not uh, something that has a single cause and a single prognosis, etc. but it's a syndrome. Uh, and we doctors say that something is a syndrome when there is a heterogeneous group of disorders, in this case, autoimmune neuropathies, that share some features, but that have different causes. All of them, in this case, respond to immune therapies, and this is why they are presumed to be, <coughs> sorry, uh, they respond to, to immune therapies, and this is why they are presumed to be autoimmune. This is what they have in common, but what are the variable things? They present uh, uh, and evolve in different ways, and not all patients uh, evolve uh, similarly. The neurophysiological or EMG patterns and the findings in the nerve biopsies are different as well. Uh, there are different causes and mechanisms of disease, and they might respond to different types of immune therapies. Even though they respond to immune therapies, uh, not all patients respond to the same thing. And this is why we believe uh, within CDP we are including several different diseases, uh, and that's why we call it a syndrome. Indeed, the guidelines uh, for uh, CDP uh, acknowledge the presence of at least these five variants. The typical variant that is symmetric in the four limbs, uh, proximal and distal weakness. Uh, there's a variant that is only distal, so meaning only weakness in the hands or the legs. Sorry, in the in the in the hands or the feet, not uh, in the upper limbs, uh, in the upper part of the upper limbs or or the or the thighs in the in the legs. Then there is a variant that is focal or multifocal. There is an asymmetric variant. There are variants that are only motor and variants that are only sensory. Each of them with with its own uh, diagnostic criteria. And why it's important to have these guidelines in mind and to classify well these disorders because. As um, uh, Jeff Allen and Richard Lewis uh, described many years, well, several years ago, almost half of the patients that are chronically treated with immunoglobulins and that are referred uh, in a, for a second opinion uh, uh, to a reference center do not have CDP. So that's a lot of misdiagnosis, 50% of the patients. And this, uh, in, in, to a large extent, depends on the poor use of uh, the diagnostic guidelines or free interpretation of the diagnostic guidelines. And we need to be aware of that. If you are a patient that does not follow what we would expect for a CDP, maybe the first question we have to ask ourselves is, do I have CDP or may I be one of these guys that have been misdiagnosed? And so uh, how do we avoid this misdiagnosis? by applying strictly the diagnostic criteria, by trying to find causes and mechanisms, and this is much more, uh, much less easy, and then by using biomarkers as much as we can, at least in those variants of the disease that have biomarkers to, to look at. If we start checking uh, the causes and mechanisms of CDP, uh, pretty similar to what happens in, in Guillain-Barre syndrome, that is a, an attack against the myelin sheet of the nerve, and this attack uh, induces an inflammation, and this inflammation is the one uh, that finally ends up in nerve damage and, of course, symptoms and disability. Uh, one of the main things that have been described to be uh, important in CDP pathology is antibodies. These are antibodies, and antibodies uh, bind to different places in the, in the um, uh, nerve, and to the myelin sheet or to the node of Rambier, these small gaps between myelin uh, are called the node of Rambier, and these uh, are uh, these antibodies are important to cause uh, uh, disorders. Uh, there are many different types of antibodies that have been described in CDP. Uh, we are not going to enter in detail here, but just so you um, see, this is a work from our group uh, uh, several years ago in which uh, we can see that um, around 50% more or less of patients with CDP have autoantibodies, uh, but the problem is that we only know a fraction of these antibodies. We only know the target of these antibodies in a fraction. This is important because if we knew the target, we could uh, use this as a diagnostic biomarker, as a, as a way of saying this patient has this type of CDP with this particular antibody. Uh, and if we don't know the target, we cannot do that. Uh, as I said, the guidelines uh, were published uh, um, uh, 
few months ago, uh, the, the new guidelines, it's the second revision of the diagnostic guidelines. And this is important because this uh, prevents misdiagnosis. And um, one important thing is that when we use the guidelines, we are not just checking the clinical symptoms of the patients. Uh, we need to start with the symptoms, but then we incorporate uh, uh, electromyogram, uh, the neurological exam, the CSF, the, so the cerebrospinal fluid, maybe sometimes biopsy, ultrasound or MRI and response to therapy. And with all that, with all that, if, if patient fulfills criteria, then we reach a diagnosis. Uh, this diagnosis uh, uh, can be uh, relatively straightforward or not so much. And then we have to revise constantly if the patient fulfills or not this the criteria. In the guidelines, in these new guidelines, a new diagnostic category has appeared. Uh, so these guidelines are about CIDP, but there is a group of neuropathies that fulfill CIDP diagnostic criteria. If you do this process of checking the symptoms, the electrophysiology, etc., you would diagnose this patient as a CIDP, but these uh, patients behave in a different way. And these patients are what we call autoimmune nodopathies. Uh, it's called nodopathies because they are neuropathies in which uh, are antibodies targeting node of Rambier structures. This is the node of Rambier, it's a structure of the nerve. Uh, antibodies against this node um, are, um, are found. And these antibodies are known to be pathogenic, so, uh, and they are specific for. Uh, for groups, for this group of patients. And so they can be diagnostic. And this is why they are now in a different uh, diagnostic category. We are going to talk briefly about this new diagnostic category. A lot of the research that has been done lately in CIDP is related to this autoimmune nodopathy group, this novel new uh, description of this novel uh, disease. Basically, they behave very similar to uh, Guillain-Barré or a CDP, they are kind of in the middle. They are severe enough to be classified as uh, Guillain-Barré syndrome, but they present a little bit slower than Guillain-Barré syndrome, and that's why they are not uh, uh, in any of those groups. And an important thing is that, of course, uh, to classify a patient as an autoimmune nodopathy, you have to find antibodies against the node of Rambia, against this peripheral nerve structure. <clears throat> The causes in this case are more clear uh, in this uh, category because we know that these patients have these antibodies against the node of Rambier or the paranode of Rambier. And the, good, the important thing here is to know that these patients do not respond well to conventional therapies. So if you are a patient that is, that is um, classified as having a CIDP, but, but the response to immunoglobulins is poor, or you keep worsening despite the use of immunoglobulins or steroids, then uh, there is a chance that you have one of these disorders. And, the good, and it's important to know that because these patients may respond really well to rituximab. Uh, and then uh, identifying promptly uh, this type of patient uh, for us physicians, but also for the patients themselves, it's important. So uh, the disease does not progress and, uh, and it's not associated with um, nerve damage and uh, non um, uh, and with uh, uh, permanent disability. Uh, there are several antibodies described. Uh, the first one to be described was antibodies against contacting one. This accounts for 3% of patients classified as CIDP. Norofacin 155 that accounts for 5% of these patients. Casper 1, 2%. And another Norofacin uh, uh, accounts for 2%. So this is a rare, uh, even rarer disorder, but as, uh, as mentioned before, very important to be aware of it because uh, it associates with a different type of treatment. Uh, these antibodies are pathogenic, uh, and, and this is something relatively new in CDP. We were trying to find uh, causes uh, for many years, and this is the first time that, even though this is a, a very rare variant of CDP, this is the first time in which we know that the antibodies uh, targeting these uh, proteins of the node of Rambia are the ones driving the disease. So removing these antibodies uh, should improve the disease, and that's what indeed happens in the patients. Uh, it also depends on many, on many other factors, but at least is 
is uh, one of these disorders in which we have a good biomarker to diagnose and follow up. And we have to make the test properly. And this is very important also for patients. Um, there are different types of tests out there uh, to, to define the presence of these uh, autoimmune nodopathies. And not all, all of them are equally uh, accurate. And we are finding a significant uh, amount of patients diagnosed with some of these antibodies that have um, had the antibodies tested in a way that is not proper. And this is very important because uh, you may end up with a diagnosis of autoimmune nodopathy, which is uh, not correct because the test has not been performed according to what the guidelines say. And what guidelines say is that you need to do a cell-based assay, which is a type of assay, uh, is, is this one. And, the, and then, if possible, a confirmatory test with other techniques. And this, you may think uh, that this is not for you, that this is more for physicians and it's true, but it's just to highlight that if you have been diagnosed with some sort of uh, autoimmune nodopathy, whatever uh, it is, uh, and you don't behave as expected when treated, uh, maybe the first thing to, to reconsider is the antibody test itself. And finally, uh, we have these other two diseases, multifocal motor neuropathy and the polyneuropathy associated with monoclonal gammopathies. These are, are even rarer disorders. Uh, one of them is uh, multifocal motor neuropathy, is a, a focal, uh, asymmetric, uh, predominantly distal motor disorder. It does not have a sensory symptoms that follows a chronic course. And in this case, it's also, also associated with these anti-gangliocyte antibodies that were also describing Guillain-Barre syndrome, but in this case, they are a different type, a subtype of antibody. And this is a disease that responds to immunoglobulins relatively well, but it, the problem is that it only responds to immunoglobulins uh, and we don't have any other treatment. You will see later that we have some novel treatments ongoing. And then we have this anti magneuropathy that is uh, a, a bit different, it's more sensory, is less aggressive, and is uh, also chronic, but in this case, uh, and it's associated with its anti mag antibodies. Um, but in this case, we don't have uh, good treatments uh, for any patient. Uh, we use rituximab, we use immunoglobulin sometimes, but this is not um, well proven that they are really effective. And then we switch to monitoring of the disease, which novel things we have. These are the old things we use uh, for monitoring patients, our uh, reflex hammer and, and the, the, um, the, tuning, the tuning fork. Uh, more recently, we use vigorimeters or dynamometers, which are very useful. Uh, also the questionnaires from the patients, uh, but then uh, we are entering in a new era uh, in which we may be uh, uh, starting to use uh, biomarkers and devices that could help us monitor more precisely the disease. But this is more spread. And we are going to talk about this system uh, because this, is, uh, this was funded by the European, sorry, by the GBS ADP Foundation International. This is part of uh, Elva Pascual uh, Benson Fellow. And this is a project that we have to try to monitor the disease, uh, the gait stability, the gait uh, velocity, the strength of the muscles using devices that control for a plantar pressure, for a length of the steps, uh, pressure of the foot, um, uh, position of the uh, joints, uh, also the muscle electro electromyography, etc. Right? We don't know if this is going to be useful or not so far, but this is an, a new way of trying to monitor patients a bit more precisely than what we do now. And finally, uh, we have biomarkers. We have uh, uh, a biomarker is uh, usually, uh, when used in this context, is a, a test. It can be a blood sample, it can be an imaging, so, I mean, an imaging test, uh, but uh, it's, a, it's a test that helps you uh, or informs you of some aspect of a disease. In, in this case, we are using it uh, as a, uh, usually as a, a molecule, something that can be detected in blood or in the cerebrospinal fluid, and that is used for, for diagnosis, prognosis, 
prediction of response to therapy or relapses. There are many other, uh, but just uh, we focused in one that is very widely used in many other diseases like Alzheimer's disease or multiple sclerosis that is called the ser serum neurofilament light chain. This is, uh, you know, let's say a, tre a trending biomarker because it's very useful to see if there's some nerve damage uh, and you can assess that uh, in the blood of the patients. You don't need to, to go to the tissue or to even check in the cerebrospinal fluid, but even in the blood, you can see if there's nerve damage or not. And this is really, really useful because so far we didn't have any tool like this one. And uh, again, as an example, there are many others out there. This is our own example. And Lorena Martin from our group describes that this uh, really uh, correlates really well uh, these neurofilaments with the outcome of uh, guillain barre syndrome patients uh, when tested at the beginning. So you enter the emergency room and you have these neurofilaments really high. This uh, gives you uh, high chances of, of having disability in the end. Um, and also it helps us monitor the disease. These biomarkers are also being used in, in CIDP, so it's not just in, in Guillain-Barre syndrome. And now we have this collaborative effort that is called the INC-BASE, that is led by the Amsterdam group, but many others uh, across uh, the world, mainly Europe, but also in the US, uh, are providing uh, information and patients. Uh, and uh, this is, this is uh, hopefully a, a, a joint effort that will um, give us more information on, on the utility of biomarkers, on the utility of therapies in this disease. And also these neurofilaments are useful for autoimmune nodopathies as they are in GBS or in CDP. And this again is work by Lorena Martin. Uh, most of the, uh, of the research that is happening in, uh, in this anti neuropathy is happening in the IMAGINE study. Uh, it's a uh, as the, as the um, INC-BASE or the IGO study, which I didn't mention uh, in, the, in guillain barre syndrome, this I IMAGINE study is uh, aimed to collect patients from all over the world with clinical information and also uh, laboratory samples uh, to try to, again, uh, uh, try to describe or discover causes, biomarkers, uh, response to therapy, etc. cetera. Uh, and with that, I'm going to switch to the final part of my presentation that is going about uh, therapy. This is a long part uh, as well, uh, and, but I hope you get some um, strong ideas. First thing is that I'm going to talk about clinical trials. When we are talking about novelties in therapy, we are going to talk about clinical trials. And what is a clinical trial? For those of you that don't know, Many of, of you might even have participated in, in, in some, but for those of you that don't, a clinical trial is a research study, is a research that is aimed at evaluating a medical, surgical, or behavioral intervention. And this is the primary way we have to find out if a new treatment or a new drug or diet or medical device is safe and effective in people. It's, it's let's say, a, a way of structuring uh, how um, novel uh, therapies are um, studied so we can be sure that they are effective or not and, they, and that they are safe or not. If we take what we call the pyramid of evidence, the pyramid of evidence means how relevant is uh, the information that you can extract from a study to decide whether or not that information needs to be used in the clinical routine, this pyramid, as you can see, the top one is the clinical practice guidelines. Uh, I've mentioned before the guidelines for CDP and, and Guillain-Barre syndrome, and these are the, the standard treatment that you have in that moment. That's what everyone should be following. And this is uh, uh, really well characterized uh, information. Uh, and that's why we have to follow that. Uh, below that is meta-analysis or systematic reviews, which means that you collect information from different types of studies and you, uh, you systematically review whether or not uh, the information that is collected is uh, accurate or not, is um, uh, methodologically correct, etc. And this information uh, is also very useful. But I'm showing this picture just so you see that right below these systematic reviews, the randomized control trial is the 
third a layer of evidence. And, and when we have to trust something regarding a therapist, we always check the randomized control trials. And we were going to talk about that later on. And as you can see here, when we are seeing studies that are only animal or laboratory studies, this is of no use for clinical routine. And also it's very of, of very uh, little use, uh, case reports, case series, uh, expert opinions. We don't consider expert opinions to be uh, relevant unless they are based on something more solid like randomized trial or, uh, or meta-analysis. And, and so this is how, uh, so you can see that anecdotal cases uh, and, uh, or information uh, arising from anecdotal cases is not something that we usually consider. We need to do good studies, strong studies to be assured that what we are doing is effective and safe. These are the randomized trials. And uh, there are many different types of trials. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go into detail, but, but at least just say that there are phase one, phase two, and phase three. Basically phase one uh, is usually performed in, in healthy volunteers. And here what you assess is if the drug or an intervention is safe. In phase two, uh, you start working with the patient that you are going to be, that is going to be the final objective of the therapy. And this phase two is also mainly addressed uh, as assess, uh, to assessing um, um, safety, but it's also a trial in which efficacy is starting to be considered. You start to include or incorporate some efficacy variables uh, to see whether or not you see something that can be helpful. And then uh, if you see something and you go to phase three that are large, very costly, very massive studies that, uh, that include only patients with a disorder that is object of study and uh, that are longer also. And in this case, they are mainly assessing uh, efficacy, but also uh, uh, safety and uh, other um, exploratory uh, outcomes. When we are talking about studies uh, and, and clinical trials, uh, we uh, tend to show this type of picture in which you see that when someone reports something in the lab, uh, to the moment uh, an, an approved treatment is reached, uh, there are many years, you can see here that up to 10 to 12 years, and uh, many, many of the, uh, the drugs or the treatments that are tested fall in what it's called the funding valley of death, meaning that uh, there are many interesting molecules in the preclinical stage, meaning in the animal models or in the uh, cell culture models, uh, but most of these potential treatments do not find a way forward. Uh, only those that are really promising, that are really good, enter in phase one and, and then phase two and phase three. Uh, the, the, the further up we increase in this ladder, the more costly uh, the uh, trial is. And this, of course, uh, it's also, uh, also influences the amount of drugs we uh, end up having. Uh, of course, there are not many trials in CIDP, for example, or multifocal motor neuropathy, because it's a very rare disease. And uh, if you have to organize a very costly trial, uh, you need to find money for that. Essentially, what a randomized trial uh, is um, organized is this way. You have a, a population, let's say CIDP patients, a treatment group and a control group. And there is a random assignment. This random assignment is necessary because that way you uh, split the two populations in a way that is not depending on what you decide, or, but on, on chance. And then uh, you follow them up and see if there's a difference in the group treated versus the group untreated. And if there's a difference, you can, you can assume that this difference is only due to the uh, intervention, to the treatment in this case, because there are no differences in the population because the two populations have been split in a random uh, fashion. And then you compare results and go, uh, and go uh, for, let's say, approval of the drug. There are trials that are blinded, only the patient does not know what it's taking. Most of the trials, the most accurate ones, are double blinded in which the physician and the patient don't know what the patient is taking, so they cannot be biased. 
and uh, there are uh, certain types of of trials, particularly phase two, one or phase two, that are non-blinded uh, because you are assessing only safety uh, and because you might rely on biomarkers that are objective measures and not so much in clinical status of the patient that is more subjective. So which trials do we need? If we want drugs approved by the FDA, the European agency, etc. If we want drugs approved, we need to, to practice uh, controlled, randomized, double-blind uh, trials, or we won't have uh, new drugs in our disorders. And another important, uh, let's say, feature of the trials is that as, as they are blinded and patients and physicians don't know what's going on uh, uh, with their body because they have they don't know which treatment they are given or they cannot assume or interpret what they are given then you start see, seeing uh, interesting patterns this is a trial that was performed several years ago in cdp in which fingolimod that was a drug used in multiple sclerosis was tried in cdp and you can see two interesting things first of all there's no difference between patients treated and patients not treated so the trial was a negative trial you see these curves, the relapse rates are the same. And, but, but then you see here that 40% of the patients did not relapse despite not having uh, any treatment because they were uh, with placebo. Uh, this means that uh, there's a population of patients that are considered to be active in the in the in the, let's say, general population of CDP patients. And indeed they are not because they are not relapsing when you have them on placebo for 39 months. Uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, uh, you know, four years. Um, so this is something that was not clear until we didn't start doing, or we didn't check uh, the, the clinical trials in a blinded fashion. So this is other, the other importance of uh, doing blinded trials that you start seeing information that was not obvious uh, when you are not blinded in your clinical routine. Most patients say that when we propose them to participate in clinical trials, that this is like being used as an animal model or as a, as a, um, uh, yeah, a, a lab animal. Uh, and this is indeed a little bit true. Uh, so we need uh, to, to use this type of experimental approach with patients as well, uh, as well as we do them with animals, because there's no other way to do therapies, to, to have novel therapies. There's no other way to try uh, uh, if a drug works or not, and then decide if this drug deserves to be funded and deserves to be tested in patients more widely. So I uh, encourage you to sometimes uh, be brave and, and provide a, a, or, or be willing to participate in these trials. So uh, we are going to talk in a minute about uh, clinical trials, but which therapies do we have now? Essentially, as you very well know, we have immunoglobulins that work in TBS, CDP, and multifocal motor neuropathy. We have corticosteroids that essentially work in CDP, plasma exchange that works in Guillain-Barre syndrome and CDP. And we have other treatments that are rarer treatments like rituximab or cyclophosphamide that are only for specific types of patients. But as you can see here, corticosteroids date back to the 1958. Uh, this is a slide that I took uh, from uh, Philip Eftimov, uh, a, a variant of Philip Eftimov's slide. And, and you can see how computers were in 1958. So this is kind of an old treatment to be using at this point. This is an IBM computer of this year. And this is uh, immunoglobulins. And immunoglobulins are also really old. Uh, they were first tested in 1982. And this is uh, when Spain organized the, the World Cup. This is the, the logo of the World Cup. And this is uh, when I was born. So this is really old as well. <laughs> so we kind of need, desperately need new treatments, modern treatments for these disorders, even though these ones are doing a good job anyway. If we want these treatments, we need to uh, become uh, or at least be prepared to at some point test novel things uh, or, or, or else we are not going to have these novel therapies.
This is a general graph on the different mechanisms that are operating in, in these disorders. And you can see inflammatory cells here, T cells, B cells, plasma cells, antibodies, complement. Uh, you see here a neuron with the Schwann cells uh, and here in more detail. But I'm showing you this so you can then see where each new treatment that we are testing is uh, acting uh, uh, in this scheme. For example, we can treat the, the cells that, uh, let's say, kill the, the myelin sheath. We can kill the cells that produce the antibodies. We can decrease the amount of antibodies, but we can also uh, uh, inhibit a complement that is a way antibodies have to cause damage. And uh, with that in mind, I'm gonna show you the different types of molecules that I just sketched. The first thing, uh, is uh, that we have, as I mentioned, B cell depletion, so cells that produce antibodies, autoantibody depletion, not killing the cell but removing the antibodies, a complement inhibition that is uh, inhibiting the way antibodies cause damage, and antigen specific therapies, meaning uh, that we can even try to kill or erase the antibodies that are only the ones that are abnormal, let's say, and not any type of antibody. The first approach is B cell depletion, so killing uh, B cells that are the cells that produce antibodies. And basically, this is performed by rituximab, a drug that we've been talking before, uh, and essentially it's, it's being tested in CDP. Uh, as I mentioned before, it, the final objective would be to kill this cell that is making antibodies so they, they don't produce antibodies anymore. This uh, also arises from previous work, observational work, anecdotal cases in which we saw uh, and this is in autoimmune autopathies that killing these cells uh, led to important improvement to these patients. But now we have three trials uh, that are either ongoing or being planned. One that is in Japan that is also only for autoimmune autopathies and a couple more that are uh, the CDPRIT and the R4 CDP that is for any type of CDP, uh, both in Italy and USA. Uh, the second approach is antibody depletion, depletion, and this can be done by two different mechanisms, uh, FCRN inhibitors and endopeptidase. Uh, the final objective would be to decrease the amount of antibodies that go into the nerve and that kill the cells. And these FCRN inhibitors, uh, we have three different types. There are others, but these are the ones that are either being studied or planned to be studied in disease, and essentially uh, this is being used in CDP. Uh, basically, uh, the mechanism of these drugs is that uh, we, have, we all have this mechanism of recycling of antibodies. So the cells capture antibodies and they, they, they release them back into the, uh, to the bloodstream. But what these uh, drugs do, they inhibit this recycling and all the antibodies are uh, let's say, degraded uh, more rapidly, and this leads to a decrease in the amount of antibodies. Uh, this uh, is being shown in, in healthy volunteers that different doses of these drugs decrease the antibodies uh, uh, further, depending on the dose. And we have two ongoing trials, Edgar Tigimod, uh, there is a large uh, tr uh, trial that is uh, halfway now, uh, and Hippocalimab that, that has not started yet in Spain. It might have started in other places, but I, I'm not sure about this. And, uh, uh, and last, uh, but this is, uh, I'm, I'm leaving for the last because this is really new uh, information that we have from the recent Peripheral Nerve Society. Uh, this is uh, Rosanolixitumab. It is another FCRN inhibitor. Uh, that there is a phase two, a small trial, uh, and unfortunately, there's no difference between the placebo treated and the rosanolixumab rose treated patients. So this is a negative trial, meaning that it doesn't seem to work this approach, at least at least this, this drug, this rosanolixumab uh, in, uh, in this CDP. This trial has several problems uh, because it's small, uh, it's uh, short, 
so it has several problems, and this is why we still are hopeful that uh, Fgar Tikimod and Nipokalimab can provide some help. But uh, uh, just so you know, uh, particularly those of you that have participated in this trial, that this trial is negative. And this is negative for any of the measures that we uh, tested. Uh, that is different scale, the IROX, the INCA, the grip strength, etc. And one might say, well, maybe this is not useful because it, this drug has no effect. And that's not correct because the drug does indeed decrease a lot the amount of antibodies in the blood. But the problem is that despite the antibodies are decreased in the blood, the patients don't get better, or at least they don't get better than placebo patients do. So in the end, uh, it's not useful anyway. <clears throat> The other way of decreasing the amount of autoantibodies we have is endopeptidase or imlifidase. Uh, this is mainly being tested in Guillain-Barre syndrome. This, is, this graph is not from Guillain-Barre syndrome, it's from uh, transplantation, but it works for, for you know, explaining the mechanism. Basically, this is an antibody, and what this drug does is to cut the antibody in half. So this part and this part, and these antibodies, when they are like this, they are not uh, pathogenic, they are not harmful anymore. And you can see that the decrease in the antibody levels is really sharp. You can go up to zero levels of antibodies in four hours. Uh, so that's why it, this is being tested in Guillain-Barre syndrome, because it's, it's quick, it's rapid, and it's profound, and you need this type of approach in Guillain-Barre syndrome. It would be like having a plasma exchange, but a chemical plasma exchange. And there's a phase two trial that is unblinded, open in France, that it's supposed to finish according to, uh, to the company in December 2022. And then we have complement inhibition. Um, we have several uh, drugs that are being tested and in different disorders, in CIDP, in Guillain-Barre, and multifocal motor neuropathy. Basically, complement is, uh, you can see it here, uh, complement is a molecule or a group of molecules that, um, that are uh, a way that antibodies have to, to kill the things that the antibody attaches to. So um, to make it simple, the antibody tags, selects what's, what needs to be attacked and the complement kills it. So the antibody is the specific part of the, of the system. So it's specifically recognizing something that needs to be killed, uh, either um, due to a normal functioning like a bacteria or due to disease, like in these disorders. And the complement is the, the final effector that kills the cell, or that kills the, 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 the pathogen. Uh, so inhibitors, what they do is, in, is prevent that this happens. Uh, what is complement? So complement is one of those things that takes a lot to learn uh, in the medical school, uh, because it has many different molecules, many different pathways. And uh, essentially, it's, as I said, a system to uh, um, uh, cause damage when something is being tagged as, uh, as needed to be eliminated. And it's also an amplification cascade that uh, makes other cells to come, etc. But this is a very basic overview of what, of what complement is. You can see here that there are many complement factors, many molecules and many pathways uh, that uh, they all end up into uh, what we call the terminal pathway that is the one that kills finally or causes damage. But we have different types of drugs inhibiting uh, several of these molecules. First uh, disease that has uh, complement tested is Guillain-Barre syndrome. And we have Eculizumab and Crobalimab. Uh, we had a trial that, has, that was finished already in Japan. Uh, then we have an, an ongoing phase three trial in Japan and Crobalimab trial that is uh, starting now. Uh, it's been organized and starting now in Guillain-Barre syndrome. In this case, what we are inhibiting is this, uh, this factor here, so the terminal pathway. Uh, as I said before, there's, there was one Japanese trial that has already been uh, uh, finished a couple, uh, three or four years ago. Uh, and this was a negative trial. This negative trial included very uh, uh, a low amount of patients, and this probably uh, is the driver of of the of the trial failure. But if you see closer to the data, uh, it always uh, patients treated with eculizumab were better than those with placebo. 
meaning that maybe if we increase the sample size, if we increase the, the population of patients, we would be able to see uh, a, a difference between these two treatments. And indeed, uh, if you check patients able to run at week 24, Eculizumab patients, uh, clearly uh, three quarters of the patients were able to run at week 24, which is something relatively uh, amazing. Uh, uh, versus 18% of the placebo patients. This is something very exploratory. So you don't have to take this as a, a proof that this drug is working, but it's uh, something encouraging to test further this approach. And this is what is happening now, that we have this crobalimab and the phase three trial with eculizumab uh, ongoing. So we can see whether or not this drug is working in Guillain-Barre syndrome. Another complement inhibitor is an Exxon 005 that is being tested in Bangladesh and Denmark and USA. In this case, it's inhibiting this part here, C1Q. And uh, so it's a different part of the complement system. And uh, the preliminary results, these are very preliminary, uh, show that, again, patients might behave a bit better when treated with this drug than when treated with placebo, uh, both in the biomarker analysis and the clinical analysis. But these are very preliminary data, and we need to, of course, wait until we have more uh, solid data. Complement inhibition is also being tested in CIDP, and this is a Sanofi drug, B020. In this case, it's exploring the other part, the C1S part of the, of the C1 mechanism. And there is a phase two trial that is open label in this case, ongoing and recruiting. Uh, and uh, we don't have any data yet, so I cannot show you uh, if this drug works or not for CDP yet, but let's see what happens. If it were positive, this trial, of course, a phase three will come afterwards. And finally, um, complement inhibition is also being tested in multifocal motor neuropathy, uh, or at least it's starting to be tested uh, with this trial uh, that uh, has just started and uh, that is the first trial in multifocal motor neuropathy in many years. So we are hopeful that we can add some other drug to the immunoglobins that, are the on, that is the only drug we have now. And finally, yes, yeah, so you see another type of approach. We have what we call, sorry, this is in Spanish, but uh, uh, we call um, uh, uh, antigen specific therapies. And, and in this case, uh, anti-MAC neuropathy is caused by anti-MAC antibodies. Uh, these antibodies target this molecule here that is called MAC, myelin-associated glycoprotein. And here, uh, what we do or, uh, is we, uh, we have a polymer that mimics uh, uh, the, the chemical structure of MAG. And by mimicking that, the antibodies are treating the polymer or, or targeting the polymer and not the MAG itself. And so you, uh, with this approach, you can deplete uh, anti-mag antibodies from the bloodstream. This was the, uh, the idea, this was the strategy, this was tested in animals and it worked really well. These are the results in animals in which the antibodies decreased after every infusion. Problem is that uh, the trial was tested in phase one in patients, in a single patient, and these uh, had to be stopped due to side effect that was not severe, but that uh, uh, the analysis that was performed afterwards said that this trial shouldn't proceed. And, and, and this way you also see how trials can fail at, at any point. And finally, we have future trial, future challenges. Uh, we have more potentially good therapies than patients to test those therapies. And that's why trials are important. And so we are also trying to envision novel ways of designing trials so we can take uh, the patients we have uh, in, a, in a way in which several drugs can be tested at the same time and not in parallel. Uh, so comparing one drug with the other and not one versus placebo, another one versus placebo, etc. But this is yet uh, to be defined how we are going to do this. Uh, and just to finalize, sorry for this long talk, but in summary, I just wanted to convey the message that autoimmune neuropathies are heterogeneous and rare, and this is a challenge for researchers and, and 
and also a challenge for physicians diagnosing these disorders that that working on defining uh, causes and biomarkers is crucial to improve management as autoimmunopathies how sh have shown us and that novel therapies are being tested and and of course this this needs uh, that patients also participate uh, because if not we are not going to have ever uh, better therapies and with that, I want to thank my small lab here. This is Elba Pascual, that is the one that, that got the Benson Fellowship, Lorna Martin, Sinta Yeshan, Nuria Vidal, which is our research nurse. And this is the group we are in. Uh, and uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>